Being a fan of MMORPGs over the past decade has been quite a long road of disappointment. We've had Kickstarter scams, we've watched as monetization has single-handedly ruined otherwise promising games, and we've had multiple exciting projects be cancelled or remain in a state of perpetual development with no hope of ever releasing. Well, unfortunately, the latest disappointment comes in the form of an MMO that many were hoping would reinvigorate the genre, the Riot MMO, a game that everyone was excited for based purely on Riot Games' track record of never releasing an unsuccessful product has basically gone back to the drawing board. We never had any concrete info about what this MMO was actually looking like or saw any footage, yet alongside Ashes of Creation, this was one of the most hyped upcoming MMOs. Thankfully though, Ashes of Creation is still progressing quite nicely, and we've seen some huge improvements to the combat showcased over the past few development livestreams. As usual, in this video I'll break down the past 4 months worth of updates to keep the casuals up to date with Ashes progress, who don't have time to tune into the 2-3 hour livestreams every month. In case you missed it, Ashes of Creation's Alpha 2 will be playable in Q3 of this year, so there might only be one more of these update videos from me until we have some actual gameplay to experience again. But for a special MMO, you're going to want a special PC. A PC capable of handling Ashes of Creation's epic large-scale battles, particle effects everywhere, tons of players on screen, and the latest Unreal Engine 5 graphics whilst running at a smooth frame rate. This is why I've ordered a new gaming PC from today's sponsor, Starforge Systems. Do I really want to be in a situation where I'm dueling another player to impress some hot e-girl on Discord, only to die because of bad frame? right? Fuck no. And with my brand new Voyager 2 Elite, I'll never have to blame my failures on frame rate again. If I die, it's 100% only because I was lagging. Starforge have PCs available for multiple different levels, all hand built by professional nerds in Austin, Texas. At entry level, you've got the Horizon series, which are perfect for the everyday gamer. Next up, you've got the Navigator PCs for the more serious gamers, packed with next gen components and ready to withstand the abuse of your multi day Cheeto fueled gaming binges. And finally, for the people like me who make gaming their entire identity, you've got the Voyager PCs, which are so powerful you're basically future proof for many years to come. Perfect for enthusiasts and content creators. Additionally, if you're not looking to upgrade your entire PC yet, Starforge also offer custom cases and plate lights, so you can add a bit more personality to an otherwise bland looking rig. Click the link in the description below to check out Starforge's epic lineup of gaming PCs now, and be ready to experience the next generation of gaming without compromising performance. So in my last Ashes update vid, we covered the August, September, October and November updates, which showcased progress to the village nodes, the event system, the caravan system, and artisan skills. Starting out with December's livestream, which takes place in a winter-themed Riverlands. The focus here was the updated Ranger combat, which has come a long way. As you can see, we've got two full hotbars of abilities, which shows that class design is well on its way to being ready for Alpha 2. To keep this as concise as possible, I'll start by showing each ability along with its tooltip so you can just see what it does rather than rambling. First up, we have Snipe, a solid opener ability. Next, the weapon basic attacks. Barrage. Headshot, which is a ranged execute ability that has cooldown reduction applied to it if the target is marked. Mark of the Bear. Mark of the Raven. Mark of the Tiger. Next, we're given an overview of the Hunt abilities, which are basically Ranger self buffs, starting with Hunt of the Bear, Hunt of the Raven, and Hunt of the Tiger. Scattershot, a ranged AoE cone ability that has optional charge capability for a more highly focused shot. Airstrike, not only does this provide AoE crowd control and damage, but the mobility and animation on this one is amazing. Additionally, it can also be used to traverse gaps and verticality, easily my favourite ranged ability showcased so far. Next, Thundering Shot. Lightning Reload, which is a self buff that allows you to use select abilities with no cooldown. Bear Trap. 
Call of the Wild, Raining Death, Disengage, another great traversal ability, and finally you've got the imbued ammo abilities which come in three types, weighted, barbed and concussive, three different self buffs that imbues your next 10 shots with the various effects displayed on screen. Overall, the reaction to the updated Ranger combat was received very positively by the Ashes community. For me personally, I was especially a fan of the fluidity of the two mobility abilities, Airstrike and Disengage, as well as the basic attacks that fire much quicker than I expected. I also like that the mark abilities are off the GCD, and I think the visual effects so far look pretty good for this stage of development. Aside from the combat, we also got a look at the Ranger skill tree and weapon skill tree which further augments how your abilities work. I won't go into details on this as it will likely change with balancing, but this should give you a decent idea of how you can change your abilities to suit your playstyle. After the ability overview, the livestream concluded with some gameplay of the Ranger in action, as well as the usual art showcase which I'll flash on screen now. And that was pretty much it for the December 2023 update, overall a great update to end the year. 2024 started off with an absolute banger of a development livestream that showcased Ashes of Creation's caravan PvP system. Starting out, Steven has his raid group make their way to a viewpoint where they lay in wait, ready to ambush a passing caravan protected by another raid group. The caravan approached, then battle ensues. Oh my god. Oh, it's, it's bloodshed. This is our loot. Don't let them get away. Once the players are slain, the raid then turn their focus towards damaging the caravan, which visibly gets destroyed, catches fire, and the crates of loot carried by the caravan are then scattered around the area. A victory icon then pops up on the UI and instructs the raid to pillage their loot. At this point, you're able to see that the type of contents in the crates is displayed with an icon on top of the crate. Some crates contain commodities, some contain materials. Steven approaches a green marked crate, presses E, and is able to open the crate to loot stolen commodities. These are basically certificates that can be sold to black market vendors for gold. The second type of lootable crate is material, in this instance, rubies. Due to the sheer amount of loot though, this is too much for the raid to carry. Additionally, if you manually loot the crates, you get much less money for turning them in compared to if you deliver them via your own caravan. So Steven opens his inventory, clicks on the caravan item, and this begins a countdown for a caravan to be summoned. The length of time you need to wait for this summoning depends on the distance between you and the node your caravan is stored at. Next, the group need to wait around the summoning flag and defend it from attackers. Eventually, the caravan arrives, we mount up, approach the cargo, and there's a button appear on the caravan hotbar called Collect Cargo. Upon clicking this, an AoE circle appears, and you're able to instantly loot the cargo within the radius of the circle into your caravan. The raid then set off, having successfully stolen the cargo from the other raid group into their own caravan, and eventually reach a body of water. Here we're able to see how a ground caravan is able to convert to a raft after going through a few minutes of building. During this process, you're able to see the details of how the caravan is slowly taken apart and rebuilt into a raft to traverse the water. Obviously, it's very vulnerable to attack during this process, so the raid will need to be ready to defend it from attackers. Steven's group repels the attackers, defending the caravan, the caravan successfully converts into a raft, and we're able to see it slide down the ramp and splash as it's deployed into the water. Really nice attention to detail. The raid group swim over to the raft, jump on, and we see this really cool scene of the boys out on the water, freely moving around the raft, wind in the 
sails, waves generated from the movement of the boat, it all looked super cool. Whilst on the water, it's explained that the game will have a current system with the water similar to Arcage, where your speed will increase if you sail with the current and slow down whilst against it. If you do nothing, the current will slowly move you along on its own. Current strength will be different depending on the river and the location. After a bit of sailing around, the raid run into an ambush whilst at sea, but turn around to safety, eventually finding a good location to disembark the raft and convert it back to a land caravan. In doing so, the entire conversion process is repeated, but in reverse, with the raft this time being deconstructed and needing to once again be defended. With the land caravan rebuilt, the group make their way to the node where they're attacked one final time, they successfully defend the caravan, then arrive at the node where the goods are able to be unpacked. To do this, talk to a caravan master, click caravan storage where all of your goods will be displayed, then you're able to right click on the goods and unpack them into the node cargo storage, which will take a certain period of time during which the materials being unpacked will be temporarily locked. Next, we head over to the commodities vendor and sell those crates directly to the NPC. And finally, we head over to a shady back alley room where we're able to sell the stolen commodities that were manually looted to a black market vendor. The black market is, however, only available should a node choose to unlock it via the node marketplace skill tree progression path. Very brief art update to end the January livestream, and overall it was an update that was received pretty well. Although there was a lot of concerns from the community regarding there seemingly not being a whole lot of risk to attacking caravans on the side of the attackers, which sparked quite a bit of debate. We don't have time to get into this in this video, but overall another great showcase where I was particularly impressed with the attention to detail when it came to the animation of converting the caravan to a raft. February's development livestream was an interesting one as it was focused around commissions and gave us a good idea of what day-to-day -day solo oriented gameplay would look like in Ashes of Creation. Starting out, Steven's piloting a mage and heads over to the node commission board. At first glance, this reminded me a lot of New World's town board missions, except with the addition of varying rarity levels for missions, and that's pretty much what they are. Solo content that funnels players into other content and contribute to the progress of story arcs, taking you to areas where events are triggered, and also pick up side quests along the way. We take two commissions with objectives relatively close to each other, and along the way are beckoned over by a minotaur, which after some dialogue offers us a side quest to talk to his brother. Find the brother who then gives us another side quest to kill other minotaur, and after killing a few an event is spawned where the minotaur leader is summoned, which also results in a change of the weather to a storm. The storm features weather hazards in the form of lightning bolts, which damage mobs and as we find out later, can basically one shot you. Yeah. Something I found a bit off during this gameplay was how the rain changes direction based on your movement of the camera. It just didn't look good at times. The next 20 minutes is basically just doing various types of quests in the form of commissions, side quests and events. Personally, I found this livestream quite hard to watch as Steven's piloting of the mage didn't make the class look very appealing to play. After completing some objectives and arriving at a viewpoint, the gameplay section of this livestream ends with the node levelling up and the beginning of a new story arc which brings with it changes to the area. As usual, a quick look at the art update. And that was pretty much it for February's development livestream. Overall, I thought this one was kinda mid. I thought the environmental hazards on display were cool, but seeing that mage gameplay with the clicking and backpedaling was really hard to watch. The community reception to this one was quite positive though, with many comments saying things like, it's starting to look like a somewhat finished game. Q1 2024 ended with an absolute banger of a development livestream, this time showing off the updated combat to the fighter class. Similar to what we did with the ranger, I'll just show off each individual ability with the tooltip info on screen to keep things concise. Starting out, we're actually seeing the male orc race in-game for the first time. We get a quick look at the skill tree, a short explanation of the momentum system, which is essentially rage if you're familiar with the warrior from World of Warcraft, with some ability 
abilities generating momentum and others spending it. Starting off with the first ability, Blitz, which is basically your standard warrior charge ability, except this one seems extremely strong in that you can jump and charge vertically to get on top of high ground. Next, Brutal Cleave, which is an AoE cleave ability and momentum builder which shares a cooldown with Overpower. Overpower is basically the single target counterpart to Cleave. Maim, which is probably my favourite warrior ability, which can be augmented via the skill tree to either be a frontal cone or range shockwave attack. Battle Cry. Whirlwind. Cataclysm, another super impactful big damage AoE. Rupture, this one reminds me of Bloodseeker's ult from Dota 2. Crippling Blow, basically hamstring from WoW. Lethal Blow, your executability. Something interesting with this however is that you can spec it so that 50% of your overkill damage is returned to you as health and mana. Blood Fusion, an off GCD leech buff. Lunging Assault. Leap Strike, basically heroic leap on steroids. This can also be used to traverse verticality and gaps. Next we've got three different forms which are basically stances. Form of Ferocity, Form of Celerity, and Form of Fluidity. Next we've got Exert, which basically combines the effects of each of your forms into a big spender, where for 5 seconds or so you'll be unstoppable. This also acts as a CC break. Up next we got to look at the weapon skill tree and greatsword basic attack combos, and it's worth remembering that each class in Ashes will be able to use any weapon. You could play as a greatsword wielding mage for example, it basically just changes your weapon basic attack, and each weapon has its own skill tree. With the ability showcase out of the way, a group was formed and they demonstrated how the warrior looks in group play. During this section, I noticed that you seem to loot mobs individually in Ashes, which looks a bit clunky. Personally, I think it would be much better if they just added the AoE loot option along with auto loot, exactly how it works in World of Warcraft. If it's not broken, don't fix it. During this section, we also got to look at some destructible environments and eventually they kill a boss, complete some objectives, and that was pretty much it for the gameplay section of this livestream. Overall, I really like the direction they're going with the fighter class, and it's looking like a strong contender for my main at release. The only real critique I have is that some of the abilities look like they're skipping frames, so perhaps some improvements to the animations, but other than that, the combat showcased here actually looked really good. Here's the usual art update. And at the end of the livestream, it was mentioned that Intrepid Studios is currently going through a bit of a hiring process. So if you're someone that works in the gaming industry, then check out their website for open positions so you can help bring about this MMO's release before the end of the decade. To summarise my thoughts on all of these updates, it's a night and day difference with how Ashes is looking now compared to Alpha 1. The game is starting to look very playable now, and I'm even starting to think that the combat is looking decent. With a bit more polish, this could have the potential to be one of the best hybrid combat systems in the genre. Things I don't like that could be improved. The looting looks clunky, animations need to be smoother, and the lighting as a whole could be improved, as in some places it makes the visuals look kinda rough, for example the scene at the end of the commission's livestream from the viewpoint. I can't believe it's been almost three years since I last played Ashes of Creation in Alpha 1. Seven years since I first covered this project. Ashes of Creation is truly my last hope for the MMO genre. I suppose Pax Day looks decent, but everything else looks either mid, or is guaranteed to be pay to win due to Korean developers. Let's just hope nothing unexpected happens that would cause this game to not make it to completion. 
But that's it for this video. As always, let me know your thoughts on the development progress of Ashes of Creation in the comments below. Steven does often read comments on videos like this, so he'll likely see your feedback. Help us out with a like for the algorithm gods if you enjoy these update vids, and click the link in the description below to get yourself a Starforge PC, because you'll probably need one to run this game with maxed out graphics. Social media on screen, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.